Shrewsbury is in any case worth a visit. It's one of those many English places where if you'd been living there 200 years ago and would suddenly reappear in the middle of the old town, it would take you only seconds to get your bearings. But today I'm here on a specific mission. I want to find a grave. To be precise, the final resting place of one Thomas Farnolds Pritchard, who died on the 23rd of December 1777, just two years before he could see the completion of his masterpiece, a true marvel of civil engineering which we are going to have a look at in a few minutes. We can find the entry about his burial in St Julian's church book, but that is as far as things go. Whether I'll find it is highly questionable. In this day and age, you're used to find everything with a Google search. Not so in this case. Pritchard and his wife buried next to him are hiding very well. Before we come back to our quest for the elusive grave, let's have a quick look at what makes Thomas Pritchard so special as a civil engineer. The Iron Bridge. About 10 miles southeast of Shrewsbury and just downhill from Telford, the River Severn goes through a gorge that, without much exaggeration, we can call the birthplace of the Industrial Age. Not just in Shropshire, but on planet Earth. More on this in a little while. This bridge was cast at Colebrook Dale and erected in the year 1779. If you know a bit about Abraham Darby III, you can almost hear his voice when you read these words. A bridge made of iron. So, you might say, isn't that quite a normal thing? It is today, but it wasn't in 1779. Briefly back to Shrewsbury. It was Thomas Pritchard who made the first design for this marvellous bridge, not Thomas Telford, as some believe, nor even further fetched Isambard Brunel. As much as the design of a 100-foot cast-iron bridge would have been quick work for his mighty intellect, to assume that he did so 27 years before his birth is pushing it a bit. And that is why I thought it might be nice to find and stand at Thomas' grave read whatever inscription there is, and think a bit about how things would have been for him back then. The fact that we cannot find any modern day description, picture, location of Thomas Pritchard's grave does not forebode well. Will I find it? We'll see. Keep fingers crossed. Thomas was buried at St Julian's graveyard, next to his wife, Eleanor Russell, who predeceased him by nine years. They had four children together, three of which died as babies. But where to even look for it? I'm standing in front of the locked gates of St Julian's detached graveyard. Is that the St Julian's graveyard where Pritchard was buried in 1777? I haven't found any graveyard which is just named St Julian's. I think we'll have to look further. I had an idea that this might be part of the problem. Which one is St Julian's? It was known in the late 18th century as St Julian's Graveyard, but nothing of that exact name exists now. To understand what was going on, we need to go back in time and have a look at 18th century Shrewsbury. Back then, the town was surrounded by the old walls, within a bend in the River Severn that creates almost an island. Coming in from the east over Stonebridge, today known as the English Bridge, we would see the familiar spires of St Alcmund and St Mary and the Tower of St Julian's. But when, from there, we follow the elegantly named streets Weil, Cop and Dogpole up the hill towards St Alcmund, it would have been much less built up back then than it is today. After the collapse of the Tower of St Chad's in 1788 and its subsequent reconstruction, many changes were made to the other churches as well. Sections of the naves were demolished and the churchyards were partially built over. So, 
St. Julian's detached graveyard is indeed what little is left, and chances are the remains of our talented architect are now deep below someone's kitchen table. It turns out that a lot of the gravestones during that period of reconstruction have been moved here to the back of what is now St. Julian's Church. And the very kind owner of La Lanterna, which is an Italian restaurant, inside this building here, let me into the churchyard. He's got the keys and we hunted around if we can see the gravestone of Thomas Pritchard. No luck. And so back to Ironbridge. I took lodgings at the Tile Retreat, just down the river opposite the remains of the Bedlam Furnaces. The garden is breathtaking and the whole place has been done up and equipped with loving attention to detail. It is just up the hill from the Black Swan, excellent ales and food, and a goodish ten minute walk from the south end of the Iron Bridge itself. Look how every component has three smooth sides and a rough one. The smooth sides have been sitting against the sand of the mould. The rough one, which we see here, has been exposed to the air and has thrown all sorts of bubbles and the crud had to be scraped off in the end. Thomas seemed to know a few things about this novel material. For example, that whilst it can withstand tremendous pressure, its tensile strength, that is the maximum force with which you can pull it apart before it breaks, is relatively low. It is brittle. And so he created a structure where every component is only ever compressed and never stretched. The arches, the half circles upon which the struts are fixed, where the superstructure rests upon. He was a carpenter by training and so knew nothing about how to design a bridge made out of iron. Well, obviously, because nobody had ever done it before. He used his knowledge as a joiner about how to put structural components together using dovetails and mortise and tenon joints held together with pegs. So he designed the bridge as if he would have built a wooden bridge. Such a design today would be unusual strange, perhaps even funny. But it does one thing, it gives every two components joined together a certain amount of wriggle room. And as that adds up to the entire structure, the whole bridge is surprisingly flexible. And that is why the bridge is still there. Because you see, this peaceful looking gorge is actually slowly closing in on us. Every year, slowly but relentlessly, the two river banks move together a few millimeters, thus squeezing this lovely little bridge together and upwards all the time. Any other but this design would have cracked and failed, but our iron bridge here just gracefully moved together and upwards a bit. We are looking at some 380 tonnes of iron here, much more than would actually be necessary to do the job. Pritchard and his fellow designers were lacking the mathematical models and calculation skills we have today and so decided to play it safe. And that is one of the reasons this wonderful bridge is still here. Because, you see, it's not only about static calculations and design integrity. Unknowingly, the 18th century pioneers also had to take into account the slings and arrows of outrageous geological fortune. I described how Pritchard's carpenter design saved the bridge from being squashed by the inmoving banks of the gorge. That was only part of the whole story. If you look closely, you will see many cracked connecting struts, which obviously no longer play any other than decorative role today. Apart from the already mentioned flexibility coming from the carpentry design, it is this overdimensioning that provided enough redundancy to make our bridge here survive the adversity of nature. 
The high density of iron as a structural material enables this pioneering piece of civil engineering to square the circle of not only being heavy and sturdy, it weighs an impressive 380 tons, but also being filigree, of being only a tiny low cross-section obstacle in the way of river currents. When, in February 1795, the River Severn pulled up its sleeves and flooded the gorge to a level of more than 20 foot, the Iron Bridge was the only one to remain undamaged, or even in place. While we walk towards and then up Colebrook Dale, here's a bit of history. When the glaciers of the last Ice Age retreated, some 10,000 years ago, they left behind the deep Severn Gorge here in Shropshire, allowing easy access to the rich deposits of iron ore, coal and limestone by digging sideways into the hills. These are the ingredients you need to make iron, and that is what people started doing here on a big scale from the early 18th century onwards. The River Severn was an important transport route, but could also get in the way when you had to move things or people between the then already important industrial towns of Brosley, just south of the river, and Madley in the north. By the 1750s, there was a plethora of ferries operating on this two-mile stretch of river, but that wasn't a perfect solution either, because in summer there often wasn't enough water, and in winter there was too much. In 1773, two local entrepreneurs started taking things to the next level. Our old friend Thomas Fanolds Pritchard and John Wilkinson, one of the Seven Gorge Ironmasters, started discussing a new type of bridge design, using cast iron as structural material. It may sound obvious today, but it was revolutionary at the time. Thomas started making his rather special design and a group of local people, including Abraham Darby III, as Iron Masters go the big kid on the block, organised the necessary next steps. This included an Act of Parliament for the building of such a bridge, formally signed by George III, presumably in one of his less mad moments, which conveniently also abolished the ferry trade within a two-mile strip up or down river. Some things just never change. Meanwhile, we have finished a beautiful walk from the bridge all the way up Colebrook Dale, a bit more than a mile, where we can see the history of iron making first hand. The Colebrook Dale Company, the legal successor of Abraham Darby's first business, is no more. That statement may not be legally accurate, but certainly factually true. The last activity ceased here as late as 2017, when the foundry, then making agar cookers and stoves, and very fine ones, I might add, was closed down. What we have now are some interesting industrial ruins and the Colebrookdale Museum of Iron, with the preserved remains of Abraham Darby's first blast furnace, just below the, now very picturesque, upper furnace pool. I had a very nice late breakfast in the furnace kitchen and then spent a blissful two hours roaming the museum and the whole site. Go there as soon as you can, you will not be sorry. This is Abraham Darby's famous blast furnace. After training as a brass manufacturer, he successfully experimented with coke as a carbon source for smelting iron, thus saving England's very last trees from being chopped down for charcoal, and enabling the mass production of iron. In 1709, he moved from Bristol up here, rolled up his sleeves and started the Industrial Revolution.
It looks calm, picturesque, lovely today, and in narration and even artwork of the day it was certainly romanticized a lot. But back in the 1770s, the fact that this was a birthplace of the Age of Iron, a place that had more furnaces within two miles of Riverbank than any other place in the world would have been all too obvious. The flames and glow turning night into day, the smoke, the noxious sulfuric air, the colossal river pollution, all this must have looked like Dante's circles of hell. Today we would laugh about it and point people to Sheffield if they want to see some proper action. After having failed to locate the grave of Thomas Farnall's Pritchard, let's honour him one more time by visiting one of the places where he left his architectural mark. If I remember correctly, we may find some nice fireplaces and a gothic staircase. If nothing else, some lovely gardens to walk around in the sunshine. We're entering the grounds of Croft Castle in Herefordshire. The place where the Croft family has been living for, I believe, about a thousand years. It's now owned by the National Trust, where the family still lives here. We're still on the trail of Thomas Pritchard. Apparently he's designed a staircase and some interiors in this castle. Let's see if we can find someone who's knowledgeable. <laughs> 